immediately. Immediately. Have you seen a gentleman, a very dashing gentleman, with a bird cage? No. Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, there we are. Exactly where he said it would be. And right on schedule. Oh. <laughs> well, hello. Fellow passengers getting ready to go on the ship to England, are we? Well, I hope you're looking forward to the journey as much as I am. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Mrs. Audubon. Well, Lucy Bakewell Audubon, to be precise. Or perhaps you know of my husband, John James Audubon? Well, he's an artist and ornithologist. Well, if you haven't heard of him, you will. <laughs> We're on our way to England right now to finalize the publication of The Birds of America. Well, we just met with President Andrew Jackson the other day, and the Library of Congress is going to subscribe. Would, would you be interested in a subscription? Oh, Mr. Audubon's work is really quite fascinating. Take a look at one of these samples. Now, Mr. Audubon always begins his work with a graphite pencil, moving on to watercolor, and then adding touches of varnish and pastels to make the subject appear to come alive. Now, a subscription would really be a grand investment and. <laughs> well, you look so surprised. Well, I may be of the gentler persuasion, but my husband entrusts me to manage his career. Perhaps she'll be interested in a subscription a little later on. Well, even though we're all headed to England, I can tell you're American. But I detect that most of you are from, or at least around the vicinity of Kentucky. Am I correct? Yes? Oh, I knew I was right. Oh, Mr. Audubon and I spent many of the happiest years of our marriage in Kentucky, in both Louisville and Henderson. As a matter of fact, we still refer to our two grown sons as our Kentucky boys. Now, being from Kentucky, I'm sure you're quite used to hearing stories about living life on the edge of the western frontier with Indians and log cabins as backdrops, yes? Yes, ma'am. Well, my stories are nothing of the sort. No. My stories are all about art, ambition, devotion, deception, and above all, love. But I wasn't always from Kentucky. No. The honor of my birth is where we're headed to now, England. I was born there in 1787 exactly five years before Kentucky even became a commonwealth. I was raised in Derbyshire under the comfort and security of a fine manor. My father, William Bakewell, was a descendant of the aristocratic and wealthy Peveril family. Now, father was a scientist and an independent thinker. For example, father believed that women should be educated. Oh, yes. Not only did I learn to read and write at a very early age, but I've also studied mathematics, philosophy, science, and literature, among other subjects. So yes, I was highly educated, and we lived in splendor. But still, the lure of America still called. We left England in 1801. I was a budding young lady of 14. Of course, we didn't arrive in Kentucky right away. First, we settled in Connecticut, and then Father purchased an estate in Pennsylvania called Fatland Ford, not too far from Valley Forge. The estate was a large one, and neighbors started calling on us after we arrived. One neighbor, however, remained a mystery. His name was John James Audubon. <laughs> and indeed, this flamboyant Frenchman took his sweet time in calling on his new English neighbors. When he finally did visit, father was out, so I sent a servant to fetch him. And I took it upon myself to entertain the young man who was standing in my presence. And what an intriguing and handsome man he was. We chatted contentedly until father arrived all too quickly and I was excused from Mr. Audubon's presence. <coughs> I very much looked forward to an encore visit soon. <laughs> and indeed, it wasn't long before Mr. Audubon started calling on regular intervals to see me. He later told me he thought I had that, um, oh, that, that je ne sais quoi, or that certain something that had endeared me to him. 
Oh, Mr. Audubon was a charmer, an original and flamboyant. Soon, he started showing me drawings of birds that he had taken upon his hunting trips. His workspace, or his museum, as he liked to call it, was quite messy. But he had page after page of the most incredible drawings of birds. And it was quite evident, even then, that this was much more of a passion than a mere hobby. Of course, Father wasn't entirely passionate about Mr. Audubon. Oh, Father liked Mr. Audubon, but Father had questions about Mr. Audubon's family back in France. He especially had questions about his fabricated birth certificate that proclaimed he had actually been born in Louisiana, which coincidentally happened to be issued right at that time that Thomas Jefferson purchased the land from France. <laughs> <coughs> Now, while Mr. Audubon supposedly came to America alone to escape Napoleon's recruit, father saw little business enterprise in this young man who wanted my hand in marriage. But Mr. Audubon was not to be derailed. In 1806, he decided to travel to the far edge of the western frontier to open up a general mercantile to prove his worth. In a couple years' time, Mr. Audubon came back to Fatland Ford with a little bit of money earned, a little bit of experience gained, and a lot of determination to marry me. <laughs> and Father hesitantly gave his consent. And in April of 1808, I became Mrs. John James Audubon. Three days later, we set off in a stagecoach to the edge of the western frontier to begin our new lives together. Yes, my new friend. Did you guess where Mr. Audubon opened up his mercantile? Where was the edge of the Western frontier in 1808? Kentucky! Oh, Kentucky, Kentucky, Kentucky. Oh, we spent many happy years in Kentucky, raising two sons, Gifford in Louisville and Woodhouse in Henderson. And the two towns couldn't have been any more different now, the Louisville of 1808 was delightfully situated. It consisted of about, oh, uh, uh, one main road about half a mile long. It boasted a, a courthouse and a market. It had two newspapers and the Indian Queen Hotel, which is where we made our living accommodations. Now, in Kentucky, a man was defined by how far he could shoot. And Mr. Audubon wrapped up that title the moment he arrived. <laughs> much to the delight of his new friends. He was also a grand prankster. I remember one day, a gentleman came into town searching for rare geranium species. Well, Mr. Audubon quickly produced a rare reptile niger geranium shriveled up in a flower pot. And Mr. Audubon assured the man that that little stub would blossom if only he gave it plenty of water and sunlight. Well, the poor gentleman followed my husband's instructions until he noticed a foul, strong odor emitting from the pot, and upon inspection, learned that he had no geranium. Instead, Mr. Audubon had planted a dead gray rat with its little shriveled tail poking up through the dirt. <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. Audubon enjoyed telling that story often. But did Louisville suit me? Was I happy? Was I happy living in a hotel that catered to men who would rather drink, smoke, gamble, and shoot all night long? <laughs> Was I happy when Mr. Audubon decided to shirk his responsibilities at the mercantile in favor of going into the wilderness and drawing his birds to make his portfolio thicker, but to make our bank account Thinner. Was I happy? <sighs> yes, I was happy. Mr. Audubon was the ideal husband, and we had want for nothing for the moment. I believe it was in the spring of 1810 when Mr. Audubon had the chance encounter of meeting Mr. Alexander Wilson the famed ornithologist who was selling subscriptions to his own publication, American Ornithology. Wilson examined my husband's far superior portfolio 
<coughs> and then he asked him if he intended to publish. Well, the thought hadn't occurred to Mr. Audubon, but oh, it flattered the artist in him. <laughs> Mr. Audubon's business skills, however, were no match for Louisville. <laughs> it was at this time that we decided to move our mercantile about, oh, about 125 miles down the Ohio River to a small hamlet called Henderson. Now, Henderson had originally been a destination for river pirates. <laughs> no. Henderson was not Louisville. It truly was in the middle of the wilderness. But it was growing. Newcomers came in droves. And that meant our sales at the mercantile increased and we gained great wealth. We were business owners, we were property owners, and we held a very valuable stake in the community. <sighs> times we spent in Henderson were among the happiest of our marriage. Well, they were also some of the most devastating. You see, our business, like most businesses at the time, felt the severe pinch of the panic of 1819 that swept across our country. Almost all the banks in Kentucky had failed since they had issued money without sufficient backing. Well, the panic made money matters even worse when Mr. Audubon got into a, an argument with a terrible man named Bowen who owed us money for a steamboat. Bowen stopped my dear husband, and he tried to club him to death. Mr. Audubon took 12 blows without defending himself, and then he went through his dagger and he stabbed the man. Well, I panicked when Mr. Audubon appeared at our doorstep, bleeding and, and bruised profusely. Soon an angry mob appeared outside our home. Audubon! Audubon! Show your face! Mama, Papa's bleeding. What's wrong? You know the penalty, Audubon! Last warning before we shoot! Oh, my. Well, the boys put a rifle outside our window and we hid inside the house. I tended to Mr. Audubon's wounds as best as possible. <coughs> the mob outside got louder and louder, and they got softer. And eventually they left altogether. Still, I, I didn't sleep the entire night. Though, of course, Mr. Audubon did survive. <laughs> yeah. And you might also be interested in knowing that Bowen also survived his stabbing, although he actually tried to charge my husband with assault. Upon hearing the, the, the case, the presiding judge turned to my husband and said, Mr. Audubon, you have committed a grave offense in failing to kill the damn rascal. <laughs> The case was closed. However, doors were closing as well. Summer came, and the depression that followed the panic of 1819 had taken its toll. Creditors would no longer wait. We queued up our boys and walked to our barrister's office to draw up an agreement to sell almost everything we owned. And still, it, it wasn't enough to pay our debts. I went back into our home to gather up what very few personal belongings we had left to our name. And I bravely turned to face the Henderson community. Oh, how the masses turn against you when you're no longer rich. To lose our possessions was one thing. But to lose the people we thought were our friends, that was quite another. We left Kentucky then. We weren't the, the typical Kentuckian family by any means. And yet we shared the hardships that so many Kentuckians endured. 
and we considered ourselves one of them. From Kentucky, we didn't travel far. We moved to Cincinnati where I became the sole supporter of the family as a teacher. And Mr. Audubon decided to chase his dream of art and hopefully publish a book to pull us out of destitute. Well, I thought it was a grand idea. But I had no idea how long of a journey it would be. From 1819 to 1824, Mr. Audubon would be absent from our family, first drawing birds in New Orleans, and then traveling the eastern seaboard in order to find a publisher. While Mr. Audubon was in New Orleans, there were months that were peppered with no communication from him whatsoever. And then when I would finally get a letter in the post, his, his letters were filled with words of another woman. A woman he had been hired to paint in the nude. <coughs> oh, I wasn't jealous of the woman. <laughs> what I was jealous of was his birds and the time and attention that he, he spent away from the boys and myself. It had become quite clear that Mr. Audubon started painting birds for the family. But he had now put birds before the family. I was angry and frustrated. I felt abandoned and unloved, and I was worried about the effect that this was having on our Kentucky boys. Although my anger consumed me, I have to admit that his drawings during this time were the best I had ever seen. The great egret preening its long, white, wispy tail feathers trailing down its back like a gown. A pair of black-bellied darters, their heads entwined like snakes. The whooping crane with the baby alligator scattered at its feet. Oh, they were beautiful. They were odd. They were nature. Unfortunately, no one was interested in publishing his work. <laughs> One kind engraver in Philadelphia pulled him aside and suggested that he might want to take his work to Europe, where it could be better appreciated. I just knew I had to get my husband to England. I knew my birth pace would, re would respond to his genius. I saved every single penny I had. It took some time, but I was finally able to save enough for his passage to England. And Mr. Audubon got busy collecting letters of introductions from notables, including the great Kentuckian, Henry Clay. It was 1826. England would occupy my husband's attention for three years and eight months. For three years and eight months, the post would be our only means of communication. Oh, and you remember how well that worked out last time, don't we? <laughs> but this time, Mr. Audubon's letters came with frequency. He was quite positive. He wrote and told me that he had arrived in England safely. He had exhibited his work to wonderful reviews. He had found a publisher, and he was traveling the countryside for subscriptions. But then his letters changed. He wrote to me and told me that he wasn't having his book published in a normal size, but in life size. A double elephant folio, if you would. <laughs> well, rubbish. The time and attention needed for such a publication would be a great undertaking. When I suggested to Mr. Audubon that perhaps I should join him in England to help him manage this, he told me to stay home. <laughs> I was blooming frustrated beyond all belief. Well, if Mr. Audubon was content with his birds and his newfound fame, I would let him have it. Oh, even when he missed me in 1828 and finally decided to ask me to join him, I refused. <laughs> if Mr. Audubon wanted Lucy, Mr. Audubon would have to come and get Lucy. Now, had I been a weaker woman, I never would have made that ultimatum. But I had learned to be self-reliant for many years without him. 
Now, whether I wanted to do that was quite another story. Early one November morning in 1829, I was seated at my pianoforte. In between the plinking of notes, I heard a familiar voice utter my name. My Lucy. He had come for me. I was wanted. I was indeed the lovebird in Mr. Audubon's life. Oh, and now, my dear friends, we come to the end of my little story. After a brief trip to see our Kentucky boys, Mr. Audubon and I decided to return to England together. This time, not just as a husband and a wife, but as an artist and a business manager. For we know that the birds of America will take us anywhere that we want to go, as long as we're together. Okay. Now, I'm sure I'm going to find Mr. Audubon observing birds up on deck. Perhaps together, we'll be able to convince you of a subscription, too. But in the meantime, as Mr. Audubon would say, au revoir, my friends. Goodbye. <laughs>